Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Praise be to Allah for uh, allowing us all to gather here tonight and also for giving me a really good car park out the front. Um, basically tonight I wanted to talk a little bit about um, my way to Islam. I, like Brother Clay there, grew up in the country. Uh, we had a farm. We also didn't have very much fun with chickens. <laughs> um, and again, likewise, we didn't have any television. We were left to play amongst ourselves, make our own fun. And I guess uh, I was left on those cold winter nights to contemplate about life when I was four years old and think about, you know, was there more to life? Um, and I didn't really think that much about it, to be honest. When we moved to the city, uh, I remember my best friend at the time, who really it was only happening to be my best friend because we sat together in grade three. Um, he was a very devout Christian. Now, his parents were devout Christians. He was obviously just dragged along to church. But um, my whole life, I'd never been to a church, not once. My parents had always said, um, when you die, you're worm food. That's it. There's no afterlife. You're not going to come back as a, uh, as a bird or an ant or anything. That's it. Nothing. And they basically believed that because they'd been dragged along to church all their lives. And they hated every minute of it. So when we grew up, they basically told us there's nothing else. Alhamdulillah, that gave us our own op uh, opportunity to basically think about what we believed. And they didn't force us to believe or disbelieve anything. Now, my first spiritual experience happened in grade three, when I was eight years old. Um, my friend, who I used to sit next to, best friend, um, and I used to have this thing where we'd say, swear on our friendship. You know, if you say something and you mean it, you better swear on our friendship which, I mean, was a friendship for about three weeks, so it wasn't really a really big deal. But it still meant a lot. One time, one time, one thing was particularly important to him, and he said, listen, bro, I'm not going to get you to swear on our friendship. I'm going to get you to vow to God. Now, I remember thinking to myself, vow to God? Oh, you know, what's that mean? My friends uh, said to me, it means if you lie, you're gone. <laughs> You can't lie on this one, right? You can swear on our friendship and you can lie, but on this one, it's all over. And I went, what do you mean? He goes, well, God's everywhere. Now, obviously, he's Christian, so he's explaining his belief. I go, what do you mean, God's everywhere? I can go, I can go to the toilet and he's there with me as well. What are you talking about? He said, he'll find you if you lie. And the worst part was I was lying. <laughs> and I did vow to God. And that night, first spiritual experience, I was so scared that God was going to kill me in the middle of the night. <laughs> Because I had no understanding of God or this or that, but I thought, I've lied and I've vowed to God, I'm a goner. <laughs> Alhamdulillah, I'm not. <laughs> and I made it. Anyway, uh, this friend and I, obviously, we've we actually been friends for 19 years. Alhamdulillah, we've, uh, we're not friends anymore. <laughs> but uh, we were friends for quite a while. Now, I guess my story of my quest you know, my holy path, my way to Islam began in first year university. So coming from the country, up bringing, bringing, moving to the city, having my first spir spiritual experience, now I'm in first year uni. I had a particularly bad year. Um, and this is no joke, seriously, it was a very bad year. My parents separated, which was devastating to me. I had uh, always thought of my parents as being people who'd be together. In fact, my friend's parents would, like, he'd punch his wife and they're still together. And my parents were really nice to each other and they're not together. I couldn't work it out. Um, so it sort of, it rocked my world a little bit. I had two car accidents. I'd just gotten my P-plates. Now, I'm a much better driver now. But uh, I had two car accidents in one week. Um, it was a pretty crappy car, so it didn't really matter that much. Um, I had some problems with the police as well. Uh, I won't go into those details. Inshallah, there's no one here from uh, the police. <laughs> um, my dog died, which I was particularly upset about. I love that dog. And sadly, um, I had a friend pass away. He had cancer. And I watched him slowly um, die over the period of about eight months. I think at that stage, I started to think to myself, is this really all there is? Um, is this all there is to life? Do we just, we're born, we eat, watch TV, die, that's it? I was pretty unsatisfied with that explanation. So I guess I started a holy quest. And I started thinking, I'm going to find out for myself what the real truth is, the truth for myself anyway. Um, and naturally, as an Australian, as an Aussie, 
first thing I'm going to think of is go to a church. That's, that's religion, you know, let's go to a church. Um, my friend, again, very devoutly Christian friend, recommended I go to a particular church. Um, I talked to the priest there. Well, actually, he's a pastor because of the particular um, sect that they're of. And um, I would talk to him about religious, uh, I guess, you know, questions that I had. And I kept finding that, that I was getting a lot of opinion. And um, he recommended that I go along to a church camp. I got a bit nervous, right? <laughs> but humbly, nothing else uh, happened except some fun. We went along to this church camp. Um, I'm not meaning to offend anyone here, by the way, okay? Um, we went along to this church camp, and everybody was singing so much, I couldn't believe it. I didn't know any of the words that anyone was singing. I didn't know any of the notes to hit or whatever. I felt pretty stupid. Um, but it was a really nice camp. Everyone was really loving. Everyone was really uh, nice to each other. Everyone kept on telling me that God loved me, and I kept on thinking, God killed my dog. He <laughs> doesn't love me. One night when we were in this church camp, I remember that um, we were in tents and we all snuck out, as you do. And we went down, there was a lake not far from where we were camping. And we all sat down and we were talking about ghost stories. And I swear to you, this is what we believed, we could see across the, the, the lake, the Grim Reaper. I mean, obviously the Grim Reaper is going to come to a church camp. <laughs> That's where he's going to go. And um, we all, you know, absolutely were so frightened, we all ran back to our tents and we told everyone the next day. And to be honest with you, I don't think I really did see it. I just wanted to fit in. So I was saying, yeah, it's over there, man, run. But at the same time, I don't think I actually saw anything. But what I realised at that stage was that all of these guys were sort of, the people on the camp were sort of searching for something more spiritual than they had. And so they were inventing these sort of ghosts and things because obviously I think that the sort of spiritual nature of the camp just wasn't there for them. Um, from there, I guess, uh, I, I, you know, I'd sort of talked to some of these Christians and I'd talked to certain people and, you know, I thought it was really nice what they were saying. There were some beautiful teachings in the Bible. Um, I, I still believe there are beautiful teachings in the Bible, um, but I wasn't, didn't find what I was looking for. At that time, I was working in a service station. Um, I've, you've probably paid me for some fuel in the past. It was quite a while ago, but I'm sure you have. Um, and I was working alongside um, a Hindu. Now, we're not talking Apu from The Simpsons or anything like that, but lovely guy. He was studying as well at the same university, at this university, at Melbourne Uni. Um, and we would have these deep theological debates at about midnight while people were buying their gas. You know, they were taxi drivers, this and that. And one of the things that I kept on asking him is, you know, talk to me about all these gods. I don't understand. How come you have to have all these gods? He goes, no, well, there's, there's all these gods and there's, you know, there's a certain number of gods that are more powerful. I said, but seriously, bro. What's the deal with the guy with the elephant head? Come on, you know, he's got a few arms, he's got an elephant head. Come on, what's going on there? You've got lion's heads, tiger's heads, eagle's heads. They're all so much better than the elephant's head. Why did he pick that one? And he didn't find it very funny. <laughs> so, but again, I kept on, you know, I was taunting him a little bit, but I was trying to find the truth. Another friend of mine uh, is a Mormon, and that's the Church of the Latter-day Saints. And I found that this religion was actually a lot closer to what I thought a religion should be. Um, these guys don't drink. Um, they have dress codes. They, they obviously have to be quite modest. Um, they don't drink caffeine, so Coke's out. So if anyone here uh, likes Coke, forget it. Don't be a Mormon. You can't drink it. Um, that's not the only reason, but anyway. Uh, again, I went to their house. We had dinner, beautiful meal. And then they said, listen, let's all kneel on the floor and pray. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's, that's quite nice. It was a nice meal. I should probably thank someone for it. So we said, we knelt down, and then everyone started singing again. <laughs> and I thought, what is with this singing, man? <laughs> They're not telling me the words, you know, I'm just going, hey, nah, nah, you know, it's terrible, it's terrible. And I thought I had a good voice, but I know I don't, I know I don't now. I also investigated Judaism. Um, now, as, as Samir, Brother Samir uh, mentioned, my name is Reuben, and... Uh, You've probably seen at the end of movies, you've seen Rubenstein or Rubenberger or all these sort of things. They probably thought I was Jewish, right? Because they were really nice to me at the start. <laughs> um, but again, after I kept on asking questions, I just didn't find what I was looking for. Then I looked into Buddhism. Now, I really liked Buddhism. I thought this was great. You get to relax. <laughs> you get to be one with yourself. Now, I really enjoy being one with myself <laughs> and relaxing. Um, but again, what I sort of started to find was that this is not so much a religion of God, 
but just a good way to live. It's a nice way to live. So I went and spoke to my friend, this religious Christian friend of mine, and I said, look, I've investigated all the religions and I can't find what I'm looking for. And he said to me, well, what have you investigated? And I said, oh, well, look, I've investigated Christianity. I've investigated this, this ism, this, that, all the isms. And he said to me, you've actually missed out one. I said, no, I don't think so. I think I've pretty much covered everything. He goes, well, what about Islam? And I went, Islam? <laughs> Mate, they're terrorists. <laughs> I'm not going to investigate Islam. No, they're crazy. No way, you know. But lo and behold, alhamdulillah, I found myself walking into Preston Mosque one day. I was very nervous parking my car in the car park. I thought it might explode. <laughs> I walked in through the doors, I looked around, there was hardly anyone around, I thought, good. I walked straight across the prayer rug with my shoes on. I walked straight past the brother praying. As he went into sujood, I almost stepped on his head. I had no idea, right? I walk across and I stopped. Abu Hamza came out of a door. That's the brother who just introduced us before, Samir. And I thought, this is it. <laughs> I'm about to die. <laughs> I've seen this guy before. I've seen him on the news. <laughs> I can't believe I come here looking for answers and I'm going to die. This is not fair. But, alhamdulillah, the first words to come out of Abu Hamza's mouth were, how you going, mate? <laughs> Now, he looked like he just walked out of the Sahara Desert, right? He had a beard down to here. He had the, I mean, he was wearing a dress that I thought it was a dress, right? But I wasn't going to tell him it didn't look good. <laughs> no way. All he needed was a can of VB and he could have been, hey, you going, mate? One of the boys. So, um, alhamdulillah, he was very welcoming and I was very thankful. I was quite frightened, even though I'm twice his height. <laughs> um, we basically then sat down and uh, I talked to the brothers there was a couple of brothers that were always quite regularly there during the day when I could make it, um, in between my lectures when I, when I went to them. And we used to sit down and we'd talk about the different sort of questions that I had and the things that I wanted to know about Islam. They were very hospitable. I kept on getting cups of tea, <laughs> biscuits. Now, no other religious sect had done this for me, <laughs> so I was quite impressed. And I didn't just come back for the biscuits, I also came back for the knowledge. Now, um, as an Aussie, I was not used to this level of hospitability, hosp hospitality, I should say. Um, I'm not sure, I don't want to offend anyone again, but as an Australian, if you offer someone a cup of tea and they say no, you go, okay. These guys wouldn't take no for an answer. <laughs> Would you like a cup of tea, bro? No, no, thanks, bro. Are you sure? No, 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 I'm right. Are you sure, bro? I'll go get one. No, no, I'm right, bro. No, no, I'm getting one anyway. Sure Look, I'll, I'll just get you one, right? No worries, I'll get you one. All right, man, I'll take the tea, you know? <laughs> SubhanAllah. So I had to keep on taking toilet breaks, you know, there's cups of tea waiting when I come back. I put on about 10 kilos in my quest for religious uh, enlightenment. But anyway, as I say, we get back to, the, to the, the questions I was asking the brothers. Now, what I'd found with a lot of the other churches and uh, people that I'd spoken to, religious leaders, was that when I asked a question, they would quite often just say, your answer is this. I'd say, oh, okay, sound, that's pretty good. Um, when I was sitting down with the brothers from the mosque, when I would say, listen, I've got to, I don't understand this, what about this? They would never just answer from their opinion. They would always pick up the Qur'an, they would open it up, and it would be like, they're like human indexes. <laughs> they would just, bang, page 142, read this. And I would read it and I would go, wow, that, that's beautiful. And I would say, look, you know, where's all this part about killing people and blowing up cars and... I don't see that. Is it somewhere towards the back that I haven't read it yet? You know, I can't find it. You know, I haven't quite gotten up to that bit yet. And they said, no, we'll, we'll talk to you about what we know and then we'll tell you what the media says. Now, my, my obvious um, first impressions when I walked in were that these guys were terrorists. And I found nothing but the opposite. I found that they were the most hospitable, caring, nice people. I mean, these are guys that would say, do you need a lift home? Because they saw my car. <laughs> um, <laughs> Do you need a panel beater? Do you need a, you know, a new motor? Um, but they really cared and I could see it in their eyes that it wasn't something like, um, you know, if you go to a church you need to donate 
or you know, we're looking for money from you. These guys really cared and it, it intrigued me. I thought, how can they care so much about something? It, it, it blew me away. So I kept on asking questions and as the brother before me was speaking about alcohol and marijuana and all those sort of things, obviously I'd, I'd also taken all of those things. Um, alcohol, I, I loved the drink. Uh, loved watching the footy with a can of VB, all that sort of stuff. But um, I asked the brothers, I said, look, I know that in Islam we can't drink alcohol. Well, you can't drink alcohol. And they, I remember speaking to them and they said, look, Islam is not just a religion for, for yourself. It's also a religion based on a whole social community. Um, just because some people might be able to say, I can just have a drink of wine with dinner and that's it, um, doesn't mean that everyone can do that. At the same time, some people only have a drink and next thing they've drunk 10, they're driving a car and they've run over some poor kid on the road. So the fact that Islam has this social conscience, it's saying there are some that are going to abuse it, some that aren't. Prevention is better than cure. Rather than try and look at something that we can cure later on, Allah knows we're going to abuse it, right? And let's face it, people with alcohol, they abuse it. And I was a security guard for quite a while. I saw a lot of people abusing alcohol. Um, so alhamdulillah, I started realising that Islam is not just about each individual, it's also about a community. I also ask questions about the hijab and why couldn't I wear it? <laughs> How come I can have four wives? How come she can't have four husbands, huh? But every time I'd ask these questions, I'm not going to answer them tonight because I'm not giving a lecture, you'll start laughing at me even more. They would still give me reasons and as an Australian I would, I would still struggle a little bit with some of their reasons but the more and more I thought about this whole social idea of Islam working as a community, I realised that all these things really fit well together. Um, it's very difficult from, a, from an outside point of view to think, OK, the scarf, or OK, um, the beard, or OK, the kebab, <laughs> OK, the abaya, whatever. But once you start actually looking inside the religion, working as a whole unit, as in implementing every step of the way, it starts to make sense. And it started to make sense. But again, I didn't want to just make a leap of faith because I wasn't looking just to say, hey, that's my religion. These guys have got panel beaters, mechanics. These are the guys for me, right? I wanted to actually find something that for me really made sense. One night, I was sitting at home. Now, I apologise to some people who may have heard this story. It's called the candle story. Um, I was sitting at home and I thought to myself, I want to be you know, one with myself again. I want to get closer to Allah. So I lit a candle, I opened the window, I had the blinds drawn, it was a nice night, a bit warm, you know, I thought this is about as spiritual as it gets, you know, a candle, <laughs> the Quran, I'm sitting there reading, and I stopped and I thought to myself, look, this is the time, tonight, Allah and me, we're going to have a bit of a conversation, we're going to, you know, we're going to bond. All I need from you, Allah, is just, just a sign, just a little sign. Um, look, nothing too major, just maybe a bolt of lightning. <laughs> bolt of lightning for you, man. Come on, you created the earth. This is just a bolt of lightning. It'll be easy. So I sat there and I went, OK, go. <laughs> and I swear to you, nothing happened. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I was really disappointed. <laughs> I said, Allah, this is your chance. <laughs> I'm here, I'm asking you, where's my sign, you know, come on, I'll give you another chance. Maybe you were busy, you know, it's night time here, it's busy over the other side of the world. I'll give you another chance. I said, look, this time, don't worry about a bolt of lightning, maybe I could just get a bit of a creak in the floor, you know, maybe I could hear a car backfire, something that I'll know it's for me, but no one else will know, it's just between you and me. Again, I said, go, I'm waiting, and I waited, I think I waited about a minute. And that felt like a long time at the time. And nothing happened. Absolutely nothing happened. And I was really disappointed. I thought, I'm like on this cliff. I'm on the edge of a cliff. I'm about to jump into Islam and, and I just haven't been pushed. I haven't taken that little leap. So I thought, look, I'll, I'll keep reading Quran and I'll talk to the brothers. I'll say that I spoke to Allah and he didn't answer me. <laughs> didn't even get an answering machine. Nothing. So I turned, I turned the Quran. I opened, turned to the next page where I'd finished off. SubhanAllah, the very next verse that I read, for those of you who ask for signs, have we not shown you enough already? Look around you at the skies, the stars, land, the oceans. These are the signs for the people of knowledge. 
Subhanallah, straight away my whole world changed. I was staring at the Quran, I was just in shock. I couldn't believe that I'd been so arrogant to ask for my own specific sign when the signs had been around me all the time. There's a creator because there's a creation. So I closed the Quran, I had the best night's sleep, I've got to tell you. <laughs> I went straight to the mosque the next day. Alhamdulillah, Abu Hamza was there again. I said, Abu Hamza, this is what's happened to me. He said, that's it, you become a Muslim today. <laughs> There's no mucking around with Abu Hamza. I said, but wait a second, I just had a, a Zinger burger with dude on the way here, you know. I'm going to brush my teeth or something. I heard we can't eat ham, you know, what's going on? He goes, don't worry about all that. <laughs> Yalla. So, <laughs> but when I walked into the mosque, the people just started pouring in. And I went... SubhanAllah, look at this religion. You know, I've been to churches where there's, you know, 20 people, 30 people, 50 people. There was about a thousand people that night. And I thought, this is amazing. This religion is truly the religion of, of choice. And then I found out it was the, the first night of Ramadan. <laughs> <laughs> the good old Ramadan Muslims. But still, it was nice. So anyway, Abu Hamza took me aside. He said, look, you've got to, you're going to have to say a few words. I said, what do you mean I've got to say a few words? I thought I just had to sign something, get a bit of garlic sauce on my tongue or something. That's it. I'm a, I'm a Muslim. He said, no, you've got to make sure that we need witnesses. You've got to say these words. I said, can't you just tell, let me do it in English? I said, have you seen the guys out there, man? They've all got beards down here. They're massive. I, I get these words wrong. I'm, I'm a dead man again, you know? He goes, no, you have to say them, and, and trust me, bro, you know, trust me. And I, I did, and alhamdulillah, I did. I stood up in front of all the brothers, and I, I, to be honest with you, I was looking across this sea of beards. <laughs> I, was, I was mesmerized. I started to say the words, and all the fear went out of my body and out of my heart. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu an Muhammadan Rasulullah. And I felt like a shower had been turned on and my whole body had been flushed clean. And it, trust me, I needed to be flushed clean. <laughs> I was standing up there. All the brothers started yelling out, Takbir! Allahu Akbar! I thought I'd done something wrong. <laughs> so I, I stood back a bit. And they started coming towards me and I thought, oh no. <laughs> I'm pretty sure I said what he said. And they started hugging me and kissing me. Now, I had never been hugged and kissed by that many men in my life. <laughs> but I felt the brotherhood. Straight away, I could see people had tears in their eyes. And subhanAllah, I had tears in my eyes. And I sat there with people and I, I spoke to people I didn't even know, I'd never met before in my life. And they were talking to me as though I'd known them for, for 30 years. And it was that day, that point in that moment that I realized I had more brothers, more sisters than I could ever have imagined. And good brothers and sisters, not bad ones, I'm talking good ones. SubhanAllah, I sat there maybe, I don't know, I can't remember how long, just talking to people, they were asking me questions. I went home with such a beautiful feeling because I knew at that stage that I had a clean slate. It was my chance now to start again, to forget about the drinking, to forget about marijuana, dope, whatever, you know, anything else I'd done in the past and to start doing good things. If you haven't felt the feeling that I'm talking about, I, I sincerely hope it happens to you at one stage in your life. I, I, encourage you to investigate all the religions and particularly Islam, I would say that one of my favorite verses, I'll end with this verse, is a particular verse that says, let there be no compulsion in religion because the truth stands clear from error. Assalamu alaikum.